good to see you here tonight. I know it's a little different than, not a whole lot, but a little bit. Grab a hymnal and turn with me to 399. 399, higher ground. <laughs> Basically, uh, you'll come with your child, they'll get out, they'll, they're going to have a game for them to play out in the field out there, they'll go by and get a snow cone, get back in the car, come over and get something to eat, and go by to the next thing and, and get their Bible study and craft stuff and head off. And that's it. And then you go home and you do Bible school with your kids at your house. So it's, a, it's just a different way to... Uh, Bible school and all this crazy, you know, trying to say healthy and stuff. So, be in prayer for vacation Bible school. It's in July. On July, it starts July 13th. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you. Good to be in the fellowship hall. I walk through here every once in a while, and, but it's not the same as being back here for, for service. I, I'm glad to be back here. Trust y'all appreciate the ladies getting food together and everything. It's always good. Fun. <clears throat> good several several out for the first time tonight. We're glad you're we're glad that you're here uh, tonight as well. So <clears throat> let me let me update you on a few of these prayer requests real quick. Bob Westbrook got transferred to Lufkin. Uh, I believe it was on Monday evening. So he's in the long term. I can't think of acute care, I believe is what it's called there at Memorial, CHI, and uh, be there for a while. And then uh, James, uh, James's sister, Lou Farrell, uh, she had surgery today, bypass surgery, so uh, she's, surgery went well, she'll be in ICU for a little bit, and uh, you pray that uh, she recovers from that, and then Mike Connor had surgery today. I believe it was up in Tiber again, and uh, did okay. And uh, not not sure how long he'll be there or anything, but you can uh, keep him in, in your prayers as well. I'm not sure I got his name on on that one that we printed uh, earlier today, but uh, added him a little bit later. So anyway, add him add him to your list. 
Uh, down in the family and friends section, we added a couple from Sunday, Reed Corley, and uh, uh, Miss Karen just said that he, he, he needs the Lord, so uh, so you, you pray that he, he finds the Lord saved and all that, so add him to your prayer list, and then uh, Miss Joyce's, was it her brother? T.J. Johnson, was that Joyce Barringer's brother? Yeah. Is that correct? So, uh, and I believe it was the same deal. He has some health issues, but uh, said he had never been saved either. So, uh, pray for pray for those two that they'll uh, that they'll they'll find the Lord and uh, get saved. What about the Saldanye guy? Heard from him? He's doing great. Is he? Yes. Good. 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 So uh, now we still have all of our first responder people. Down there in the brief section, uh, Jerry, is it Harvard? Is that right, Charmus? <coughs> Harvard? Okay, I put Harvard, I think. But uh, Jerry Harvard, that's their, that's uh, Charmus's daughter's husband's brother. Correct. Yeah. So uh, remember, remember that family in your prayers. Still have our homebound folks, and. Uh, a number of other folks that are just sick. My wife's one of those. She went to the doctor today sick. Took my mama to the doctor today. She was uh, ear trouble, so uh, took her. So have, have a number of folks sick. I asked Doug uh, Barnett. I don't think he come in. I asked him this morning about his mother, and uh, he said she wasn't doing real well. She's in a, <clears throat> I think, a hospice center or a assisted living center. Uh, out in Arizona. So, uh, is it Arizona? Is that right? New Mexico? It's out west somewhere. And, uh, but uh, he, he said his dad was doing, was doing pretty good. So, uh, so you, you continue to uh, remember Doug's mom in your, in your prayers. Okay? Don't, don't forget about the, uh, the several other things listed. We won't go through all of those. But uh, all the, uh, all the unrest and the uh, bull malarkey that's going on all across the, I don't know if the Greek word is for malarkey, but uh, somebody look that up, come back with a report next week. Joe and, Biden uh, could tell you. <laughs> said Joe Biden could tell you. He had a malarkey tour. If he could remember. <laughs> oh, me. All right. So let's, uh, let's remember all them and all of our law enforcement people that are uh, at risk, especially during, during these times. A couple prayer requests uh, listed down there. Men's breakfast is Saturday morning at 8 o'clock in here. And uh, they, they told me there will be a piece of lattice put up. And what side of the lattice are we supposed to get on, Kathy? Where are you at? On this end? We're supposed to get on this end of the room. So we usually sit down there, but we're going to sit on this end this time. So, so uh, if you come come to the men's breakfast, remember that on on Saturday morning. Okay. All right. Uh, after that, uh, the having a shower for David and Jesse. Uh, I think it starts at 11, and uh, so keep that in mind and uh, get get something for them if you're if you're able to do that. Does everybody even know who David? And Jesse R. Jesse's not here. Everybody know who David is? That's David right there. If you, if you go in, if you if you ever go in Best Buy, that's where David works. He's one of the department managers or something like that. And uh, so, uh, anyway, Roy, John, is he still in the hospital? Remember John, John Mouth. Any others we need to mention? All right, all right, Eddie, got another, another phone. Eddie started late, so he took up 10 minutes of my time. I'm going to set this clock back to 16. It seems that most of my ministry, it's always been my fault. I don't understand. 
That's the music guy. The, the copier quits working. I'm not even in the building. It's my fault. You know, I, don't know. I don't know. Anyway, grab your hymnal again. Turn to 473. Victory in Jesus. that we've had out for a couple of weeks or two or three weeks. There's a copy of one that's laying on the little table to be to the right of that door. So if you go out right there. And uh, we're gonna turn we're gonna get those turned in either tomorrow or Friday. And uh, I did I did read where the commissioners went ahead and did the six million dollar deal and uh, it's not the six million dollar man that we had forty years ago but the, the loan, and uh, so so we're going to be on the hook for that, and 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 I, and I, I think they 
I've not talked to anybody officially about this, but I'm, I'm guessing that they still want to try to put the unit road system on the ballot in November. Okay. And, uh, so, so the, the only way that we, the only way that the unit road bill can even show up on the ballot is for 2,900 people to sign the petition. So if, if you're, if you're here and you're a registered voter, uh, stop and, stop and sign that. There's, there's two or three laying there, so if one fills up, try to, try to fill one up and fill it up so that we don't have a bunch with three or four names on it, but uh, stop and do that on your way out if, uh, if you can. Okay, does anybody know what the significance of September the 17th, 1964 was? What's the date? September the 17th, 1964. I was a year and a year and a half old. In 14. The Beatles? So. Do I? The Beatles? The Beatles? No. Well, I don't know. It may have been, but that's not. A television show came on that night. For the very first time. No, it wasn't Andy. It came on ABC. And at that particular time, ABC, of course, we had the three, three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And NBC and CBS were by far the top dogs. And ABC was a distant, distant, they were a, they were a third class stepsister or something, something along. They were, they were way back under, but, but two shows came on in the month of September of 1964. No, one was the Jetsons. Remember that one? And the other one was the show Bewitched. And, and through, through those two shows, this is what the Wikipedia or whoever it is said, that, that ABC rode those two shows and it brought them to be the same level of a network, ABC, as NBC and CBS were. Now, how many of you watched b -Week? Okay, still on in syndication. We're going to take a little quick test. Okay? Now just don't, don't answer out loud. You can jot them down if you want to or just keep them in your mind. Just see, let, let me ask you some questions about this, about this program. What was the husband's name? Okay, don't answer out loud. Keep it, keep it, okay? But, but that was right. So everybody gets one. Everybody ought to get that. Here's the second one. What was Samantha's mama's name? Okay, here's the third one. What was the name of the bumbling aunt? She always messed things up. Here's the next one. Who, what was the name of, their, of Darren and Samantha's first child? Here's the next one. What was the name of the lady from down the street or across the street that she always seen Samantha do her, do her deal? twitching her nose and what have you. But her husband never seen it. He thought she was crazy. Remember that? All right. What was the doctor's name? And the last one I had is, what was Darren's boss's name? Okay, now I'll give you, I'll give you the answer. The, the husband's name was Darren. Okay, we got, we got that one. How many of you know the Samantha's mama's name. Raise your hand if you know it. Endora. Endora. That was her name. Uh, how many of you know who the bumbling aunt was? Lord, me and Eddie, what was it? Aunt Clara. Aunt Clara. Who was their first child? Tabitha. Uh, the lady's name that was a neighbor. What was her first name? Gladys. Gladys Gravis. What was the doctor's name? Remember, remember they would always get on there and say, calling Dr. Bombay, calling Dr. Bombay, come here, Dr. Bombay. I watched too many reruns. <laughs> what was Darren's boss's name? Larry Tate. 
Larry Tate. That means, no, I don't guess him would make a hundred. I don't think he did. And did that, did that for this reason. Paul, <clears throat> if, 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 and I believe that the Bible is as inspired and infallible and inerrant and all those things, but, but one thing we need to remember is that the Bible wasn't divided up into chapters and verses for hundreds of years, okay? So for many, many years, it just, it just appears as in, in books, paragraphs, stories, and it's many years later that they come, or come along and they begin to divide it and put it into chapters and break it into verses, and, and, it's, and it's entirely possible. I'm not saying that the Bible is wrong, and I'm not saying the men that divided the Bible into chapters and verses were wrong, but it's, but it's highly possible that, that verse 21 out of chapter 2 should have been in chapter 3. Because if you were here last week, you know that we talked about this, the, the fact that the title of what we talked about last week was the life-changing 220 principle. And it was that verse of scripture that just said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I, uh, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now we know that... <clears throat> If you've been with us or if you've been watching, then, then we know that Peter had come, come, come along here and he had, he had sort of reverted. We talked about it a few weeks ago, we called it he had become two-faced and he had reverted back to doing what the Jews did. And so he comes along here and Peter, uh, Paul confronts Peter about what has happened and all of those kind of things and that, that, that confrontation has been going on for a period of time, and, and maybe it has ended by now. We, we, we're not absolutely certain. There's really no way for us to know. But when we, when we get here to this 21st verse, we have to remember what Paul's subject is all about. It's not about works. Paul's subject and Paul's focus is grace. Okay? And that's what, that's what Paul comes along and that's what Paul has preached when Paul founded these churches and, and he established these churches to whom he's writing this letter to and, and all of these things. He's, he'd come and he founded these churches on these journeys by preaching that salvation comes by grace and, and, and grace alone. And, and there had been some folks come in and sneaky teachers or false teachers or whatever the case might be. They've come in and they've infiltrated the congregations, if you would. And to use the word that Paul used, they bewitched the believers. And they, caused, they got them to think again that salvation is not just by grace. That you've got to do something. You, you've got to, it, it, it can be grace, but it's got to be grace plus something. And and so what, what they're talking about is a false teacher would come in or somebody that was kind of pro, pro, pro the old way, the old Jewish way, and they'd come in and they'd say, now here's the real truth about salvation. And, and that is, you, if, if you keep the Jewish rules, and we, boy, there were many of them, okay? You gotta keep the Jewish rules, you, you've gotta, you, you gotta do all those things, you've gotta be circumcised, you can't eat pork, you gotta keep the Sabbath day rules, and you gotta do all those things. Now, if you do all of those things, you can be saved, and you can go to heaven. Paul comes along, he says, no, that's not the way it is. He says it's by grace, and, and they've already had a conference over in Jerusalem, and they settled this issue, so they're, so they're rehashing this issue. So in this passage that we'll read tonight, the first five verses, including the last verse of the second chapter. Paul comes along and he, he sort of bombards with five rhetorical questions, okay? And we're not going to go through and talk about every rhetorical question. Everybody know, knows what a rhetorical question is. A rhetorical question is a question you better not answer because they're really not ask, asking you a question. They're making a point in the form of a question. So if, if, if your wife were to come to you, I'm supposing that some of you may have a wife that would do something like this and, and, and would say, why aren't you listening to me? I listen to my wife. This is on video. I listen to my wife. But if she comes in and she says, why aren't you listening to me? Don't answer that question. Okay? 
She don't want to know why you're not listening to her. She just wants to make a point. You better start listening to me. Okay? So Paul comes along, and he, and he goes to making five, posing five rhetorical questions which don't need an answer. He doesn't want an answer. He's making a point to these believers, many of whom have reverted back to a lot of the old Jewish beliefs and, and different things. So he's going to come along here, and, and he uses that word, have you been bewitched? Have you been, have you been bewitched? Now, the word bewitched, we need to see what that means before we, before we tear into this thing. It, 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 it simply means to place under, this was the, the book definition for it, to place under one's power by or as by magic or to cast a spell over it would get to get somebody to believe something that's not so just by doing it. So Paul comes in and he says, hey, has somebody bewitched you? Has somebody fooled you? So, so dropping back into the second chapter, the 21st verse, let's begin to read right there. And he makes a very important statement to begin this verse. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God. Okay? That's his, that's his driving thing. I do not set aside the grace of God. And then he says, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And now he begins the third verse, third chapter. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians. O oh, foolish Galatians. And in the, I can't remember, J.B. Phillips translation has his own translation of the Bible. He, he words that little, that little, O oh, foolish Galatians. He words it this way. O oh, dear idiots. <laughs> That's the way he does it. Now, now, that word foolish, there are two possibilities for that word out of the Greek language. And, and one, one is, is the word moros. What, what word out of our language do you think we get from that? <laughs> Moral. Okay? It, it, it's that word. And, and it's a word that means somebody that's mentally or morally not there. Okay? Just, just, just a moron. Jesus used that word two different occasions in, in Matthew's gospel. Once in the seventh chapter and once in the twenty some odd chapter. I can't remember what it was. But one, one of the times that Jesus used that word is when he was, he was telling that story about the foolish man who built his house on the sand. You remember that story? Yeah. Jesus used the word moros. Okay? Our word moron. Well, Paul is not using that word. He is using the word anotos. And that word means one who can think, but does not use their power of perception. Okay? Anotos. So that's what Paul said. He says, hey, you can think and you know, but you're not using your power of perception. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And we know what the truth is, according to Paul. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit? What Spirit is he talking about? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He said, did you receive the Spirit? by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Well, he doesn't want an answer. He's telling them which one which it was. Which one was it? It is the hearing of faith. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Verse 5, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
Now, let, let, let's get started. Let's, let, we're going we're gonna to begin. The outline is on the back of your bulletin tonight, and I'm going to give you these as quickly as I can, and hopefully I'll give them to you by 7 o'clock. What is it? We're going to borrow that first line of the, 29, of the 21st verse of the second chapter. It said, if I do not set aside the grace of God. So to set aside the grace of God is to do three things. Okay? Here's number one. To set aside the grace of God is to reject the cross of Christ. To set aside the grace, to set aside being saved by grace, to set aside the grace of God, that is to reject the cross of Jesus Christ. Now Paul gives his first argument here, and that argument was is that he had already preached to these people. And, and back when he established the church and the different times that he had preached there and taught there and did all of the things that he had done there, he had always taught Christ and Christ crucified. Okay? He had always preached the cross. And I, this is just my opinion. I think when Paul preached the cross, when he preached the sufferings of Christ, he didn't sanitize it. He didn't homogenize it. He didn't do any of those things. He laid it out there, told them how the, what's the old saying, the cow chewed the could. He, he painted them a picture of what it must have, as best as his ability was. I don't think that, I don't believe he's a witness to the crucifixion, but he had, he had heard it talked about. And so when he would preach the, 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 the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, man, he, he, he let them know Christ, he didn't, he didn't swoon, he didn't faint, he didn't pass out, he didn't go through a hard time. He died for your sins. And he did this over and over and over and over. And, and, and listen, he, he, he did this and he paints this, what we would say, I mean, have you seen that movie, The Passion of the Christ? 10, 15 years ago. Mel Gibson's deal. I, I can still visualize what that, what that movie showed. But even with what I see in that movie and, and have seen in, in different productions since that time, I don't think that even he, and he got about as graphic as maybe we could get, he probably didn't get as graphic as it probably really was. And so he comes along here and he, and he writes to him. He says, before your very eyes, not, not that they were standing there witnessing the things that happened at, at the cross on Calvary's Hill, but he said, this has been preached to you. This has been taught to you. This has been demonstrated to you. It has been clearly portrayed and, 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 and all of these things. He, he said, he said the, these false teachers have come along. And they have, they have convinced you, they have bewitched you, that's the word he uses, but these false teachers come along and they have bewitched you into thinking that what Christ did on the cross was not enough to take care of your sins. And the Christians, that's who he's talking to here, the Christians in Galatia, they fell for it. They fell for it. The greatest con artist that is said to have ever lived was a guy by the name of George C. Parker. George C. Parker was born in 1860 or so. And when he was, he was in his mid-twenties, he visited the Brooklyn Bridge. It opened in, well, what year was it? 1883, New York City. He was there. And he seen just a person, just admiring, just looking at that bridge. So he gets this idea. Now, you know the story of George C. Parker? He started selling the Brooklyn Bridge. He would find somebody admiring it, so he would, he would convince that person that he owned the Brooklyn Bridge. And they said he sold it as many as two or three times a week. <laughs> he, he established an office. He had papers drawn up that looked official and, and he convinced people that he owned it and he would sell it for as little as $50 or as much as $50,000. <laughs> people bought it. And then they would, police would have to come along and, and they would have to get them people. He, he would convince those people that they could charge a toll for people using their bridge. 
And so they would buy the bridge. They'd give George C. Parker the money, and they would buy the bridge, and they would come along to build toll booths, and the police would have to come along and haul them away because it wasn't their bridge. And, and George C. Parker was somewhere. He gets arrested three or four times for fraud, and he winds up going to Sing Sing Prison. It's a prison somewhere north of New York City, 40 or 50 miles. And, and he goes to prison for the last eight years of his life. While he's in prison, he sells, I, I forgot what it was. I, I, I think he sold the Madison, the, the original, Madison Square Garden. One time he sold Grant's tomb. He posed as, as General Grant's grandson. And, and, and he sold, while he was in prison for the last eight years of his life, he sold the Brooklyn Bridge three more times while he was in prison. <laughs> You say, man, how, how, and we use that word, how stupid. How, 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 how stupid people would wonder, how, why, why would people be so gullible? Listen to me. We're not any better. You, if, if you do Facebook, you, you notice how many times somebody like the sheriff will have to come along and he'll give out this warning that there's a scam going on. And scam, they'll call senior adults or or whatever, they'll call them on the, on the telephone trying to get maybe a credit card number or social security number, and it's a scam, and we have to be warned when there's a scam. Well, when, 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 when these false teachers come and they come into the, the churches in the area of Galatia and they begin preaching or teaching these people, hey, you, you, can, you can be saved by grace, but you've also got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Paul comes along and he says, hey, you've been bewitched. They're scamming you. Don't, don't, be, don't be gullible. So, so if we, and, and this is true today, 2020, okay? If we set aside the work of Jesus on the cross and we think there has to be something else to bring us salvation, then we have rejected the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's what we need to do. Okay? And I, I'm telling you, some of us in this room tonight, we need to do this. We need to ask God for a new, fresh, and clear picture of the cross. It may be that we need to go home and take our Bibles and sit down in the Gospels and just begin to read what Jesus endured so that you and I could be saved. And we need to get that picture. And we need to ask God the Father, God, don't let me lose that picture. Don't let me lose that. Don't let me lose that in my mind and begin to think there is something else needed besides the price that you paid for my sins. He, he says, don't, don't do that because, because it's rejecting the cross when we want to add anything to it. Here's the second thing. To set aside the grace of God is to reject the cross, but it's also to reduce the value of suffering. To reduce the value of suffering. Down in the, in the fourth verse, Paul writes this, and, and, and he asked them to remember, okay? He asked them to remember how much they had suffered because of their faith. Now, we've seen this back when we were going through 1 Peter, about how much those people that we've talked about week after week after week, how much they suffered. Well, Paul asked these believers, these, these Galatian Christians, to remember how much that they had suffered because of their faith. And here's what he said in the fourth verse. He said, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now that word suffered, it can be the word experienced. So if we use that word, that verse could read this way. Have you experienced so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. So what what would he be talking about? Well, in, in, in the Jewish faith, sacrificial worship was a was a huge part of it. Okay? Sacrificial worship was a was a huge part. And not only in the Jewish faith, but in the in the pagan religions, 
of the Romans. We, we remember the Old Testament. We remember what the Jews would do. They would, they would sacrifice animals at, at the temple and, and in Jerusalem. The pagan religions, they would, they would prepare food. And they would come and they would sacrifice those things to our gods, to, to, to their little g-gods. And, and, and making sacrifices was something that made, that, that, that a worshiper did. Remember that part of the, that part of the law is about the, it's about the do and the did and, and what can I do? And, and, and if we can do something, it, it always makes us to feel good about what we've done. Well, in, in the case of worship, if, 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 we could, if we could offer a sacrifice of some sort, it would, it would make us feel good about our worship. It would, it would cause us to think or maybe cause them to think, you know, look at me. I, I, I'm religious. I'm making a special sacrificial offering to my God. But the gospel teaches us it teaches us something different. It teaches us that, it, that the sacrifice of, 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 of Jesus Christ on the cross, that's enough. That's, that's enough. Christians, it, it, we, we go back in, in the old time and when, when we, we know how the Jews were and then many of the Roman and a lot of their pagan beliefs, well, the Christians, they refused to practice uh, sacrificial rituals and they were persecuted for it okay persecuted for it in the in the roman empire the the, the pagan priest they would have they would have welcomed jesus i think everybody everybody in the house is going off tonight amber what is it amber, amber alert. alert the pagan priest they would they would have welcomed jesus but not as the one god they would have welcomed him to have been one of their many gods, to have been a part of their, uh, he would have had a place in their little uh, pantheon of gods, and, and, and they were many. But the Christians, they, they refused. They said, they, they, they said no, because what did the Christians do? The Christians claimed then, as we ought to proclaim now, there is but one God. One God. Not a bunch of little G gods, but one God. And that one God is, is, is Jesus. Jesus is, is God in the flesh. And, and those Christians back in that day, they claimed that his death was the only sacrifice that was needed. And, and they were right. Well, because they've made this proclamation, it put them at odds. Have you ever been at odds with anybody? So, preacher, I'm, I'm at odds with somebody right now. Well, this... This argument of the Christians saying that there's, there's, there's only one God, Jesus was God in the flesh, it puts them at odds with not just one of the powering groups, puts them at odds with the Jews, but it also puts them, puts them at odds with all the pagan religions and, and the Romans persecuted them as, as, as atheists because they refused to, they, they refused to worship the, the, the Roman liturgy God. Men would lose their jobs when they would become Christians because they refused to, to recognize the, the false God. And, and if you remember, there were, there were gods of everything. Okay, all those you gods, but there were gods of everything. Then, then they, just to, just to add, uh, add whatever, you had Nero. And, and, and we know about Nero. Nero didn't dislike Christians. He didn't have a a sour spot in his heart for him. He hated them. I mean, he absolutely hated them. He had them arrested. He had them tortured. He had them. He he would bring them in from his dungeon, and he would have them tarred and 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 dipped in oil, and he would have them tied to poles or trees in his garden, and he would light them on fire so that he could give lighted rides through his gardens at night, all because he all because he hated them. Well, well, if, if I, I say all those things to say this, if we set aside grace, it causes us, and, and Paul tells these people, it, it causes us to reduce the value of suffering. We're not much on suffering anymore. Because we've had it, quite honestly, we've had it too good, too long. 
And when we have a we have a taste of suffering or unrest or any of those things, we we, we begin to wonder what's what what's the deal. I, I'm telling you, these Christians, they knew what it was to suffer. And, and Paul appeals to their suffering, and he says, hey, if you can, and he's talking about their suffering, he said, if you can earn your salvation, and the cross wasn't necessary, then he says, what's the value of your suffering? You, you think about our times of suffering, and we've all had them. <clears throat> when did you learn more? Did you learn more when you were on the mountaintop of life or when you were in the valley? I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you, I learned more in the valley than I've ever learned standing on the mountaintop. And so when, 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 when the Lord, when he allows suffering to come in, in and through our life, we, we, we need to know it has value. It, it, it has some value. We remember that story in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the, starting, I think, in verse 6 or verse 7 or somewhere along there, and, 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 and Paul talks about that thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. We can guess at it, and that, that's all we do, but, but he says, I've, I've, got this, I've got this thorn in the flesh. It's a painful condition that he has endured. He, he described it as a, as a messenger from Satan to torment him, and he begged God three different times. He begged him for the Lord to take it away, but the, the Lord didn't answer, but instead the Lord promised him what? What was going to be sufficient? Grace. Grace, Grace saved us, does it not? Amen. Now, as born-again Christians, when we're going through the tough times of life, Grace doesn't save us anymore because we're just saved one time. Right. But you know what grace does? It sustains us. How many of you say I've been sustained by his grace before? See, we can't set aside grace. We can't set aside grace. Here's number three. Let me flip my page here. To set aside grace is to reject the cross of Christ, is to reduce the value of suffering, and it's to resist the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> We've all heard that old saying, save the best for last. It's not necessarily that this is, this is Paul's third argument here, or his third objection, but this is his strongest objection to what the false teachers have come in and, and, and told the people at Galatia. It's his strongest objection to this legalism that they've, that they've been that they've been taught, and and and, and it was about it, it was about that it, it it's the the denying of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now here's here's the second the second verse. Now just so you know that in this letter he mentions the Holy Spirit 18 different times, either by Holy Spirit or just the Spirit. Okay, 18 different times he mentions he mentions the Holy Spirit. But in in the second verse of chapter three. Here's what it says. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit, Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Now, <clears throat> let, 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 let me give you this picture. How many of you remember when cell phones just began to come out? I don't know what the very first one looked like, but I remember what our first, I call it cell phone, it was a mobile phone. And it wasn't anything like the phone that I carry in my pocket today. In fact, Donna worked at Hudson at the time, and Hudson made a program for all of their teachers that, I guess for a certain fee a month, you could get what they called a bag phone. Remember the bag phone? Bag phone is about, is, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of the size of this bucket. It was either black or gray, had a phone in it, and, and it wasn't a whole lot different than the phone that you, that you had or that we had in our house at that particular time. And, and, and that phone, I'm telling you, you could only do one thing with it. That's call somebody or have somebody call you. That's all you could do. Now, the phone I have now is quite different. In fact, I, I, I thought about this today. As I was at the doctor with my mom, I probably use my phone for making calls less than I use it for anything else. 
I check my email on my phone. I get text on my phone. I can surf the I can surf the web on my phone. I can watch a ball game on my phone. I can watch Andy Griffith on my phone. <coughs> I'd much rather watch it at home on the big screen, but I can I can watch it on my phone. I can do all of those things on my phone. In, in fact, I read this here a while back, I, and I'm supposing this to be true, that the in, in our smartphones, I didn't bring mine with me, but in our smartphones, there is more computing power in the regular iPhone that most of us carry around in our pocket. There's more computing power in that phone than there was on the rocket that took the men to the moon for the very first time. And we carry it around in our pockets. Now, if I still had that bag phone, and I were to take that bag phone, and I were to go up here to the AT&T store, and I would say, you know, I want, a, I want one of these bag phones. I'm going to take my iPhone, smartphone, and I want to trade it in for one of those bag phones that we had back in the late 80s. I, I want to I wanna make that swap. Man, they would look at me and they would say, you idiot. Because all you could do with that phone was to make a phone call and, and it would be an idiot. They would call me an idiot for wanting to swap my iPhone that I can do all of those things with and trade that in for something that, that all I can do is make a phone call. Well, Here's what happened. You see, when, when we set aside the grace of God, then we're resisting the work. He, he saved us. And I'm, I'm just supposing that most of us, if not all of us in this room tonight, we're saved. But listen, he didn't just save us so that one day, whenever life ends for us, and it, it may end tonight, he didn't just save us so that when we come to the end of life that we get to go to heaven. We know that he's going to prepare a place and we know that he's going to come again and receive us unto ourselves so that wherever he's at there, we can be there with him. We know all of that's true. But he didn't save us just to, so we could get to that place. Listen, he, the, the, the work of the Spirit, we're, we're all indwelt by the Spirit of God. When you were lost, the Holy Spirit began to convict your heart. It was the Holy Spirit of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit began to speak to your heart and convict you of your lost condition and he compelled you to come to Christ and you came to Christ and you gave your heart to Christ and you were saved, yes, Jesus, forgive your sin and all of those things. Well, he didn't, he, he, he didn't do those things just to leave you there and you could sit there until the bus come through to take you to heaven one day. Listen, the Holy Spirit still wants to work in you. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of sanctification. That is to make us more and more like Jesus every day. You watch what happens. I speak from experience. We spend all of our time on Facebook. We spend all of our time in front of the television. We begin to act like, talk like, Whatever it is that we've spent all of our time with. You just spend time with people. You, you spend all of your time with people that cuss like the proverbial sailor. It won't be long before you start doing some of those same things. Listen to me, brethren. The grace of God saved you. The grace of God is sustaining you through the troubled times in your life. And it's the grace of God through the Holy Spirit that, is, that desires to grow you and grow me. But if we set aside grace, then we're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to tell you, there's not one of us in this room. And let me get in the front of the line. There's not a one of us in this room that we don't need the Holy Spirit to be at work in us. 
every, every one of us, probably, probably me more than any of the rest, we need the Holy Spirit to be at work, growing us, making us more and more like Jesus Christ every day of our life. But if we're going to set aside grace and think it's something that we have to do, then we're going to resist the work of God in growing us in our life. You say, Brother Steve, I can see how those people back in the first century, I can see, I can see how they got hoodwinked. I can see how they got bewitched. But it won't happen to me. Oh, brethren, don't walk out of this room thinking it won't happen to you. Because it very well can and happen to me. Don't set aside the grace of God from any area of your life. Don't become bewitched by the teachings of our culture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity. We call it to look into the Word. But tonight it's almost like looking into a mirror. Because if we're not careful, we will get sidetracked, bewitched, and Lord, we will just forget some things that we have been taught, shown, and preached to. Truths about you. I pray tonight that every one of us in this room, that as we would leave here tonight, we would prepare to gather back together on the Lord's Day. The Lord, between now and then, that we would just ask you for a fresh look at what you really did for us, at the price that you paid so that we could even be saved, at, 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 the, at the things that you went through just so that we could stand in a place like this tonight and, and proclaim that we know you. And Lord, as we as we go through times of difficulties and hard times and sufferings in our life, that, that, that Lord, that we, that we don't enjoy it and it's not fun. But, Lord, we, we realize that when we're going through those times that you're, that you're teaching us and you're showing us. So don't let us set aside the grace and, and, and resist the 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 value of the suffering that, that you have for us. Oh God, let the Holy Spirit be alive in us and through us to make us more and more like our Savior each day. Don't let us be like those old foolish Galatians and become bewitched and to believe in things that are not so. Go home with us tonight. Be real to us tonight. And let us be near to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.